Great. Well, uh, welcome back to another uh, episode of Ask the Expert. I uh, am Matthew Goodwin from Washington University in St. Louis, uh, Department of Orthopedics. And I'm Wendy Gibbs from Barrow Neurological Institute. I'm a diagnostic and interventional neuroradiologist. So um, I'm a spine surgeon, and so I take some offense to uh, being told to be involved and ask the expert about post-op infections. But uh, I've, I've drugged Dr. Gibbs in here with me um, to talk about it. And so we'll try to focus on some of the imaging and some of our decision making in that uh, and how we go about it. And so, you know, I think we can start with what may or may not be a chronic infection in a patient that's had a spinal fusion or spinal instrumentation. So, um, you know, I want to get your take on some of the imaging findings in a patient who might be six or seven months out from a, from a surgery, a thoracolumbar surgery with, with uh, metal, who comes in with, say, more back pain, and let's say their inflammatory markers are elevated, and let's say on the plain film, I see that the, what looks like to be a little haloing around the screws. And so I uh, get some advanced imaging. I might get a CT and an MRI, and maybe I see a little bit of fluid, but it's really hard for me to tell what that means uh, in this case. Uh, maybe you can just tell us what you're looking at when you see those studies, and um, and is there anything I can tell from those studies? Can I tell if it's uh, an infection by looking at the imaging at that point, or or is it a normal post-operative seroma or fluid collection? Okay, I think you've asked two different questions there, or several different <laughs> questions there. So. Um, First of all, this highlights the need to communicate between surgery and radiology. And this is something I think we've talked about before. I try to talk to everybody about it. A lot of times in radiology, we don't get the history. We can try to look up and see maybe when their surgery was, but even what you've just described to me, like six, eight months out. If we just get a history of back pain, I don't know how many months out. I don't know if you're looking for infection or something right, else. And right. all those things are so valuable. So I think that's why, again, this, this kind of thing is really helpful because it seems intuitive, but it's not always done. Um, so in the post-op patient, it's a little bit different scenario because you've got hardware yep. and that makes imaging a challenge. So if you're worried about a disc infection, if there's residual disc, that can be some of the same findings that we talk about in our regular discitis osteomyelitis talk, you know, with the enhancement of the discs with erosions on CT of the end plates, demineralization, um, those kind of similar features, you know, abnormal enhancement in the canal, those things. But with hardware, a lot of times you have susceptibility artifact, which limits MRI. Mm -hmm. So in those cases, we try to get CT. There's still artifact, but I would say you talked about two different scenarios. If you're looking around screws and haloing, CT is the answer to really look at that a little bit better. Um, that I think x-ray is excellent. CT is good for that though. And we can evaluate all the construct that way. If you are talking about a fluid collection in the operative bed, then you still try to get MR. Mm. Sometimes you can see it on CT or contrast enhanced CT, but if MRI doesn't have too much artifact, that is preferable. Now you might end up getting both, like you said. In some cases, this I don't know if you ever do this or not, when there's too much susceptibility artifacts, sometimes we rely on PET. So sometimes PET is a little bit better CT PET with attenuation, correction, and on, you can kind of see around that artifact a little bit. So chronic infections, that's sometimes good. We use that for the skull base as well. Um, one of the few infectious indications, I think, for PET CT. So just as a problem solving tool. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So is there anything on the CT scan, when I because when I see haloing and we're months out, I'm, I'm going through a list in my head surgically is it a non-union? And maybe it's a non-union because I didn't use, uh, maybe I didn't graft appropriately. Maybe I didn't use enough graft. Maybe they're, maybe they use nicotine. Uh, maybe they have poor nutrition. You know, there's a whole list I'm going down. Uh, if I see that it hasn't fused at one of the top levels, and that's the reason maybe things are loose. Uh, but one of those things is infection. So is there anything on that imaging that would clue you into a, an infection brewing or is it is it that you have to get you have to sample it at some point or you have to make you know is there anything that, that could clue me in uh, on the ct itself you know it's interesting and you and i were talking a little bit about this um in terms of the sampling so biopsy which i would do normally for you for your infections i've never been asked to biopsy bone next to a screw 
your flu collection yeah. um, question is a little bit different, but I don't think I've ever been asked to go into a bone. Disc, yes. Flu collections, yes, but not bone next to screws. So I don't know if that would make a difference. Um, in terms of the imaging itself, you know, there's something in the radiology literature that if it's just around the tip, it might be abnormal movement. If it's diffusely around the screws, it might be infection, but I don't think that's, oh, in my experience, I don't know that that's true. When I followed up with my surgeons to say, was it infected or not? I certainly I don't, don't think know. about it like that. So that's interesting. Have I, you ever I, heard that? So I don't know where that came from, actually. And But that is something that radiologists are taught. So if it's not true, huh. it's good that we know. If you don't know it, then it's probably not true. Interesting. But those are things we would look for. So. so so let's say that I'm concerned. It's chronic. I say, hey, can you, let's say there's disc in between those levels. It looks bad. Mm hmm I say, hey, can, I think we have a chronic uh, thing brewing. Can you can you get a piece of tissue? You do. Let's say that's what it is. It's chronic. Um, you know, at that point, I think it becomes it's, it becomes a very debated uh, issue in spine surgery today. And that and that debate, I think, was part of one of your talks uh, earlier at this conference, which is now what? What, what does the surgeon yeah. do now? Do, do we take the hardware out? Do we leave the hardware in? Um, and we talked about this earlier, and I, I don't know, um, I don't know that anyone has the right answer now, or the full answer. I think all of us consider a lot of different things, and so we consider, um, is there a non-union there? So is it going to be unstable if I take the hardware out? In that case, we say we prob probably shouldn't take it out. Um, there's some low-level evidence that stability helps actually uh, heal the infection, um, and also you don't want to leave them unstable, right? Um, you know, the other thing we think about is maybe they are fused and if we take all the hardware out, it'd be very destructive. And so it would be taking away a lot of bone and be leaving big holes in the pedicles. And we worry that, um, based on their alignment and their bone quality, that it'd make them susceptible to have some fracture. And so, so in those cases, we also worry on the flip side of that, there's a lot of people that say, if it's a chronic infection, you're kind of putting your head in the sand by leaving metal in that there's probably a biofilm and there's probably something in there. And so then you're deciding, is it, um, are you going to treat them forever with antibiotics and chronically suppress them? Or do you need to figure out a strategy to get the metal out? Okay. Wow. Complicated. So let me ask you a somewhat related question. Say you have, um, a fracture in a, like say the top level, your top level or something like that. You thought maybe they were chronically infected. You, you know, it's kind of, they're already sick person. So their labs are already kind of a little bit abnormal. Their inflammatory markers were high anyway. Would you ever consider like cement stabilization in someone where you don't really know if they are infected or not, kind of a low level chronic infection? This is something I was thinking about earlier when I had a compression fracture from osteomyelitis, but it was kind of unexpected that that was why. Wait, they already have hardware in there or they, they have? Y yes or no, either one. Well, I, I certainly think that, I certainly do not think in most people of um, cement augmentation itself being very stabilizing. Now that's a loaded question. Okay. And we got into this yesterday about what do we mean by stabilizing? Um, you know, so, and I, and I think we have different meanings when we talk about stabilizing mm -hmm. something. I think we're traditionally taught cement augmentation itself is not a stabilizing construct. Mm -hmm. um, but I think the, the counter to that is, well, certainly in the, in the tumor world, there's plenty of times that we see a vertebral body collapse and, um, and, and we want to put a little cement there just to support it a little bit, just to support that anterior column. And so is that stabilizing? Or to well, treat pain. Or, yeah, to treat their pain, exactly. Yeah. Is that stabilizing? Uh, you know, it depends who you talk to, and it depends on what happens over time. Um, and so I think with the fracture, it probably depends on the nature of the fracture. Is it a um, one of these osteoporotic or even tumor bone kind of compression squishes? Or is this a real fracture that needs to be really stabilized with rods and screws. I think I would treat it, okay. um, uh, it would get treated differently based on, on the fracture uh, itself. If there's any indication there's infection though, you would not put in cement? Is that a contraindication? Because that's what oh, I, I just see. heard I recently. See, that's yeah. why I'm asking you I that question. I, I don't know that the, um, yeah, that's a good question. I don't know that there's the, that we have the final answer for all of that. I mean, there's certainly in spine, it seems like there are examples of getting away with stuff that we would normally think of as not being a great thing, right? And so I think it's very different than how, how things are treated in the joints world. 
Um, I don't know if it's necessarily that different. We think it's different. But, you know, the um, there are, you know, Jeremy Schott, Pittsburgh, has spent a lot of time thinking about post-op infections, infections when there's hardware there. And um, I think those people that spend a lot of time talking about this, thinking about it, researching it, lean more heavily towards, hey, we should be a little more, um, we should be a little, I don't know what the word is, a little more pure or, or a little more stick to principles more when we talk about this. So metal should come out, you know, we should treat it more like we do joints. Metal should come out. We should stick to all those principles we stick to in the joints world. They they, yeah. they tend to think, um, by and large, we're there's a lot more kind of chronic smoldering infection out there when we do things that we think aren't perfect. That being said, there's plenty of of low level evidence in the literature in spine saying, I don't know, you can you know leaving hardware seems to do okay. Uh, using allograft, autograft, um, some cement. There's plenty of examples of things doing fine. Uh, we don't always know what that means. Sometimes mm. we don't have enough follow-up, especially if it's in the tumor population. So I think that a lot of the questions, unfortunately, mm. are still very much unanswered. Um, and I think the um, I think the only way we're getting closer to answers, uh, honestly, is by talking to other disciplines, right? Mm. Talking to radiology, talking to infectious disease, because they certainly have a different view than, than we do about things. And I think radiology has a different view than we do when we look at some of this imaging and talk about it. Yeah, for sure. Well, on that note, let me ask you about acute infection then, because I have questions and you weren't there when I had the question. So in the immediate post-op or within the first four weeks of post-op, if I see a lucency around screws, some of the things we think of, as you just mentioned, is it because they're infected? Is it because it's still moving? When, when is that um, something of more concern acutely? How do I differentiate those on my imaging? That's turning it around on you. How do I make yeah. my imaging acute versus chronic? That's a good question. The, um, I can certainly say that in that early post-operative setting, a lot of how we feel about whether there's infection or not is driven by kind of the total um, clinical picture. And so you know, somebody that's a week out and has an MRI and there's fluid, we go, yeah, we, we did surgery, so there's fluid. And so why would you get the MRI? And maybe we got the MRI <laughs> to check the decompression. Okay. Or maybe it was for a study, but but when one does pop, or maybe somebody else orders it, that happens too. Somebody, you know, they have pain and somebody orders it. Um, but if there's fluid there, we kind of don't care because it doesn't tell us a whole lot. We were just there. Uh, we know there's going to be fluid in the, in, the, in the field. When you get to five or six weeks out, um, it gets a little trickier because there's going to be fluid there. I don't know that I can tell much about the fluid per se. Um, if And then we're looking at the incision, whether the incision's um, healed. Um, we often think in the first three to four weeks, if it's infected acutely, that it'll declare itself, that the incision's going to leak at some point, fluid's going to come out. Um, and then we think about the, the um, you know, was surgery done well? Is there real lucency? Is it, um, you know, is it just a little bit of lucency because maybe we were too aggressive with our uh, making our holes? Um, so I think there's a lot more that goes into it at that point. The inflammatory markers come into play at this point. Mm -hmm. We know that some of the inflammatory markers are going to be up for the first couple weeks after surgery, first 14 days, and then they're coming uh, or they're coming back down by then. And so that's not always perfect. It can help, though, if the trend is going back up. Um, so I think there's a lot that goes into it. I don't know that I can tell on the imaging. It's good to hear that maybe you can't either. What exactly is happening or what it exactly means uh, at that point? And I think I didn't address completely your, your question about the fluid collection. Because, yeah, that can be hard on imaging for sure. Because they're all the fluid collections in the surgical bed. Dorsal soft tissues are going to have marginal enhancement. Sometimes it can look kind of shaggy. Like if that was in the brain, you'd be worried, you know, something, right, abscess, right. brain, or whatever. It can look very abnormal. And a lot of those cases... We don't know. And the standard thing we're taught to say is sterility cannot be determined by imaging. That's like a standard thing that a lot of people see in their radiology reports, which is true. That yeah, means we need, yeah. we're need. we often asked to sample that fluid or drain that fluid and put in a drain, which is something I'm asked to do quite often, either to see if it is infected or, if nothing else, to treat their pain, which was always something we asked, like, why, why drain these? And surgeons told us right, they can right. cause pain. Those fluid collections can cause pain even if they're not infected. Is that... It's interesting you say that because the, uh, and I think we're going to be out of time, but it's interesting you say the, the um, sterility part because um, there's, not, there's nothing worse than uh, 
seeing an image and going, well, yeah, there's a little post-op seroma. It's early. We expect that. And then the read says infection or something like that. And then the patient says, am I infected? And you go, I think you're fine. Decompression looks good. And then you're kind of off to the races trying to, depending on the patient, talk to them about wh what things look like and when it's normal. So uh, to your point, the communication between uh, uh, different fields obviously helps, helps quite a bit. And learning like learning. this. Yes, yes, every session. <laughs> but you didn't answer why it helps your pain. But I will keep I reading them for you. That, I don't know that it does. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I don't know that it does. I think I'm more lean towards thinking if it's a post-op seroma, leave we're it not, alone. We're leaving it alone. Well, let me ask um, you then this last question, because then I know we're out of time. <laughs> How long do those last? Uh, you can you can you can certainly see. Um, I mean, you can certainly see seroma um, for a long time afterwards. Yeah. And it's normal. That um, that appears to not be doing any. I mean, I certainly have seen it in patients that seem fine, don't seem infected, isn't growing. And um, and let's say you revise them for some reason and it's just a clear seroma. So I, I think they can sit there for a long time. Interesting. Yeah. I'm going to go share this with all my people. Same. They're all going to watch. Ask Same. the experts. <laughs> Same. <laughs> all right. Perfect. Well, I think we are out of time. Thank, Thank you. you. As usual. Good <laughs> all right. Thanks.